I'm Corey Shockey. I lead the foreign and defense policy team at the American Enterprise Institute. And I've had a whole slew of both school teacher jobs and government jobs where I would hopscotch back and forth. Uh, about every five years that I'm in government, I get restless for the intellectual liberty of picking my own problems. And after about five years of teaching and doing my own writing, I start to get restless for consequences to my answers to these questions. And so I go back into government. My first government job was as the NATO expert in General Colin Powell's joint staff. I got there in the summer of 1990, two weeks after Iraq invaded Kuwait. And because I was the NATO desk officer, I got the fun and education of helping build the coalition that fought the 1991 Gulf War. And that's how I became an alliance expert. And I have never been able to outrun that. I had to help put the coalition together for the 2003 Iraq war, had to do a lot of work to keep countries that had troops fighting in the coalitions in Afghanistan and Iraq, fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and I also had a terrific job as the deputy director of the policy planning staff in the State Department which is the place that's kind of an internal academic think tank for the Secretary of State. I sailed on the pirate ship McCain in 2008, and I was senior policy advisor. It was a little bit different experience than for many people on campaigns, because foreign policy was the majority, foreign and defense policy were the majority of John's legislative record and the things he was interested in. Uh, and he had explicitly picked me for the campaign because I, uh, of how I thought about the Iraq and Afghan wars. So I didn't have to tell John a whole bunch about uh, what he ought to do about stuff. Mostly what I was doing was racing after the fire truck as it was already in motion. Let me give two examples. The first is one of my early days on the campaign was when the Boumediene decision came down from the Supreme Court giving habeas corpus rights to prisoners in Guantanamo. And John was uh, on the campaign trail, called in, and uh, the instruction was that I was supposed to spend all day on TV talking about what a terrible decision this was uh, and how it was gonna make America less safe. And because I was new to campaigns, I said, what? That's crazy. You need a constitutional lawyer to do this kind of work. Um, and, and John's answer was, no, we need somebody who can persuasively talk about how this will make America less safe. Nobody wants to hear the legal arguments. They want to hear the policy consequences of it. So that's what I mean by the fire trucks already in motion. There are so many things you can't control. The second example I would give is I am the poor campaign staffer who uh, helped make those 100 flashcards for Governor Palin when she was named uh, the vice presidential candidate. Because of course, the first thing any uh, opposition campaign will do if you nominate somebody whose expertise is in domestic politics, they will go after their foreign policy expertise. So we thought we could make her flashcards and um, in her defense, within 72 hours, she could, uh, if you asked her a question about a subject, could say one sensible thing about it. Doesn't mean she always used them, but she had them at her disposal if she wanted them. I was a PhD student when I went to work in General Powell's staff. And I used always to want to talk about the models of how the international order works. And Powell would try and brush me off by saying, nobody cares about your models. Um, and I would always go back and say, everybody uses models. If you think you don't have a model, it just means you are not being intellectually honest about what information you think matters, what you think the driving forces are on problems, why you think states do what they do in trying to protect and advance their country's interests. 
And by the way, I was right then and I am right now about this. Everybody has models about what they think the relevant and dynamic factors are in a problem. And as a policymaker, it's actually really helpful to be straightforward about what you think matters in a problem. It helps your staff figure out what information it, they need to bring to you as you're making decisions. It also helps them to challenge when they think you're wrong. And that's a really important part of policymaking. I spent the majority of my time when I was the director for defense strategy and requirements on the NSC playing defense, saying, yeah, I understand this is what you want to do, but here's my sense of what the consequences will be. Here's another way to get done what it is you want to get done. Because a lot of policy work is responding to events that are occurring or initiatives that people more senior in the process want to undertake. And it's your job as a staffer, not just to say, uh, here, here's what you want to do and here are some ways to do it, but also to say, here's what you might not be thinking about about the problem. And again, that's where models of how the international order work really matters. The more senior you are in the policy process, the more difficult it is to have and stick to an agenda of priorities because there are so many things going on at any given time and the experts in those areas will almost always advocate doing something. So the first thing is it's very difficult to discipline the American government processes not to do anything and to, to teach staffs that not doing something is a policy act. It doesn't mean I'm not paying attention to the problem. It just means I think it's a diversion from my priorities for us to take action. Also, because the United States is involved all over the world, um, there's always a tendency to think that what's happening at the moment is the most important thing going on if it's your area of expertise. And so having the discipline to, to force priorities through the system is a real uh, area of policy excellence. It's very hard to do in the process because things are always happening and, and good staffs always see opportunities um, to improve our position, to help our friends, to hurt our adversaries. Uh, and so there are, you're never short of work being done. In particular, when I was on the NSC, I went home every single day knowing that there were things that were going to go wrong because I wasn't at work paying attention to them and trying to unsnag problems and trying to put resources where they were going to be most effective. And you really have to, when you're in a policy job, you really have to um, brace yourself that things are going to go wrong, that you're not going to get everything right, and that every time you take for yourself or take for other problems means that things are going to go badly somewhere. And if you can't shoulder that burden of mistakes and errors and things left undone, you have no business being in a policy job. So I agree with Dr. Professor Henke's analysis that the more you know about what a government wants for itself, the more effectively you can craft a pitch for why they should care about your problems. In my experience building coalitions in 1991, in 2002, and in 2003, that most countries wish they had the luxury of the problems the United States worries about because they have more pressing problems. And so it's a challenge to get countries to divert their attention from their own more urgent domestic problems or their own more urgent international problems to care about what we're trying to round up a posse to do something about. So typically um, how we go about the process is uh, we send a message out to American ambassadors in all of the relevant countries. 
tell them what, what we are looking to do and ask them to come back with suggestions about how we should reach out to various governments. So is it more effective to go through an international institution? Typically we go privately first to the government and then at the request of many governments, we'll make the same more generalized request through international institutions. Because for example, for a country like Luxembourg, it's easier for them to say yes if they say yes at NATO than saying yes to the United States bilaterally. So you look for what are the avenues that are gonna make it possible for this government to say yes. What is it that they need that we can help provide? My favorite example is when putting the Iraq War Coalition together in 2003, um, the Polish government was still transitioning from having a Soviet style military to having a NATO style military. One of the important differences between those two things is that um, in Western militaries and NATO militaries, non-commissioned officers do a lot of the work that junior officers do in Soviet style militaries. They wanted us to build an NCO, non-commissioned officer training academy in Poland to help them figure out how to make their NATO, make their military more NATO compliant and more effective. And part of, so we agreed to do that. They agreed to run an international division of 17 countries in Iraq. That's not the only reason they agreed to do those things in Iraq, but it helped us give them something they wanted for something that we wanted. And typically that's the horse trading that goes on. You figure out what do they need that we can provide? How can we be helpful to them? Um, and find ways to do it because American alliances are voluntary, they're not compulsory. And so they operate the way domestic politics operates. And that's my general theory of American hegemony, that what has made us so successful is that we have created in the international order a macrocosm of how we operate in American domestic politics, that uh, institutions matter, that values matter, that persuasion matters, that horse trading to mutually beneficial outcomes really matters. I think a lot of people um, have misconceptions about two precursors that matter for thinking about the international order. The first is that they have this notion that uh, there was a mythical time when the United States was comfortable being part of international institutions and was a good, reliable ally, and our allies did their fair share without us hectoring them. And I wish I could figure out when that time was, because I don't see it from about 1774 forward. Um, and, and so it's always hard creating and sustaining alliance relationships, creating and sustaining institutions. It's not newly hard. Math class has always been hard. So we shouldn't excuse ourselves being bad at it just because it feels difficult to do. It's always been difficult to do. The second misconception I think people have is that the liberal international order was, you know, the brainchild of a bunch of reckless academics sitting around a faculty lounge when in fact, the, the men who built the post-war international order had lived through two world wars and a great depression in their lifetime. And what they wanted was to create patterns of behavior, alliance relationships and institutions that would that reward peaceful interaction between states with guarantees of security and with greater prospects for prosperity. That's what the liberal international order was about, creating rules of behavior that were beneficial for everyone who participated and that if you participate, both increase the positive outcomes of security and prosperity 
and don't require states to shoulder the entirety of the burden for those things by themselves. The US pointedly didn't wring the last ounce of advantage out of every negotiation and didn't do the bare minimum that was our fair share in institutions because we wanted to incentivize cooperation. And it's bought us 70 years of peace and prosperity. And I really worry that we are recklessly burning through the goodwill and the margin of error that this order created for us and created for others by being short-sighted and selfish. Those are important challenges and they're also true. The United States is a self-interested actor in the international order and the liberal international order has had as its core uh, the transatlantic relationship and the anchor of Japanese, Australian and Korean alliance relationships in the Pacific. So the challenges are true but um, I can't think of a system that doesn't have difficulties and downsides. And the genius of the American-led post-World War II order has been that it prevented the strongest states from fighting each other. And that is a non-trivial outcome. In fact, it's a fabulous outcome. If you asked most people who'd lived through the first or the second world wars or the great depression, they would probably grieve the burden that the so-called developing world has had to bear of proxy wars, but they wouldn't grieve that the strongest powers in the international order weren't fighting each other. So that's what the system was designed to do and it achieved it it did achieve it at the cost of proxy wars, where the weakness of the strong deterrent of the Soviet Union and the United States challenging each other's core interests and their ability to effectively communicate and understand each other's core interests. And remember, there were times when those were dicey things. Berlin in 1948, Hungary in 1956, Berlin in 1958, Berlin in 1961, Cuba. Um, so it's, it's not that the system was as tranquil as it looks in retrospect, but it did serve its principal purpose, which was to prevent great wars among the strongest powers in the order by effectively segregating each other's essential interests. And the weakness of it is that both sides were prodding for each other's core interests at the margins in El Salvador, in Vietnam, in Korea. Um, and that very often led to conflicts that were an enormous burden for the people of those countries. But there were also upsides. If you are South Korea, you are probably reasonably happy that the United States was willing to fight a proxy war on the Korean Peninsula because otherwise there would be no South Korea. And it's one of the great success stories of expanding the liberal international order. America's alliance relationships are the undergirding of the liberal international order in part because at the end of World War II, the United States was the only country strong enough to be able to control Germany and Japan. But also the United States was the only country imaginative enough to believe that Germany and Japan could become different than they had been. And this notion that our values are universal it may not be philosophically true, but it is practically true because Germany today is a very different country than Germany was in 1940. Um, and that's the refutation of John Mearsheimer and the mechanistic realists. 
that, that countries do become different. They are different because of their history and they become different because of their subsequent opportunities and choices. And America, the United States didn't start out wanting to have a huge web of alliance relationships and to embed those relationships in institutions. Um, but the evolution of challenges after World War II and thinking about what tools were available to the United States to manage those challenges, that is to manage our security and our prosperity, providing security guarantees to other countries so that they didn't rebuild militaries that their neighbors would feel threatened by, or that might set off a scrambled kind of security dilemma. The United States was broad shouldered enough and broad thinking enough to anchor a very different kind of Europe than Europe had had, which is to say, we will remain involved. We will be the guarantor for all of the parties of Western Europe. We will make sure Germany doesn't grow so strong that Britain and France um, are fearful of it. And if you look at, um, you know, at a reconstruction of Germany from 1949 to 1954, the United States was still the only Western country that thought Germany could be different. The Eisenhower administration had had to threaten um, a fundamental rethinking of America's involvement in the security of France, Britain, the Netherlands, Denmark, and others, unless they were willing to let Germany become a normal country again. Um, so our hegemony helped undergird different kinds of regional relationships in Europe and in Asia that made Germany and Japan, if not normal countries, it made them much less of a threat to their neighbors. That's the anchor that American dominance and American alliances created. And if you look at the frictions that South Korea and Japan still have in their relationship, for example, Asia would be a very different place if the United States was not the security guarantor for both of those countries because the distrust between them is still enormously uh, present. So the origins of American alliances were to stabilize the two major regions of the world in which we had continuing vital interests. And the way that those relationships have evolved, it's a great measure of our success that we can complain that Germany and Japan and South Korea don't do enough for their own security. Because my grandfather had a very different set of concerns about those countries. Um, and what they have become is what we wanted them to be. And so it's gonna take time to recalibrate these relationships in a way that as our allies have grown stronger and more prosperous, they can shoulder more of this burden, but we can't do it, we can't succeed at doing it by threatening them with abandonment. Because my experience in government very strongly suggests that countries don't make brave choices when they're threatened with abandonment. They tend to make bad choices when they're threatened with abandonment. And that will set off the very kind of security problems in two regions in which the United States remains vitally interested. Uh, rather than it, unless we negotiate this carefully and make sure that, for example, South Korea feels comfortable with the Japan that we want. My, sen my policy reflex is that you shouldn't replace something with nothing. So people who don't like America's alliance relationships or think they are too burdensome or think they are imperialistic um, need to answer two questions. The first, what is the alternative you are advocating? Because most American presidents would be really happy to have a basically stable and prosperous system 
in which the United States only has to spend 3% of its GDP on defense, and it has an array of other countries willing to join in and defend what we want defended. Uh, I don't, I can't think of another system that's better or cheaper for us than the one that we have. Uh, and because you have the routine interactions that creates trust among allies in Asia and in the institutionalized relationships we have in the NATO alliance. And those make us able to fight in close and effective proximity to other countries. And that doesn't happen organically, that has to be produced. And if you look at American losses in World War I, quite a number of them were because we didn't know how to fight alongside other countries. Um, and if you look at the losses at the start of World War II in North Africa, you see the similar pattern. So um, the, the price we pay in blood for not being able to fight alongside other countries willing to fight alongside us is pretty severe. Second, um, the United States is the pacing military for everybody else. That is, our alliances pull other countries up to the standard of fighting, the speed, the jointness, the integration of effort that the United States has. And without our alliances, we don't get that benefit. So if you think Germany has a bad military now, wait until you see how little they do when we're not dragging them up to our standard of performance. What the end of America's alliances means, it won't result in other countries doing more. It will result in other countries doing less. So the American military will have to shoulder more of the burden of fighting whatever wars we do fight. And we are likely to have to fight more wars, both because our alliance relationships stabilize the relationships among our regional partners. So uh, uh, European countries may start to worry about what European countries spent several hundred years worrying about, which is the relationships between Russia, France, Germany, and uh, the United Kingdom. But also, um, so we'll fight more wars, we'll have less ability to share the burden amongst others. And also, you will have less warning where problems occur. Because one of the big advantages of our alliance relationships is they identify problems as they're occurring between Greece and Turkey, and they create the requirement for us to do something about it. So the world will become more unstable, more dangerous, and uh, the United States will have more uh, military obligations than we have by sustaining a basically beneficial status quo. I can't think of a better outcome that comes for that uh, than we have to the current obligations. And again, remember that uh, by managing these problems when they are small and irritating, it's much less costly than when they have grown to the magnitude that the United States has no choice but to do something about them. Because that's the difference between managing the security problems we have now and managing the security problems we had in 1940. If the alliances fray, we won't get people, we won't get countries willing to do what we want them to do. They will make a whole host of choices, whether it's uh, a nuclear weapons armed Japan or a nuclear weapons armed South Korea or a conventionally dangerous but non-nuclear Japan, a Germany that does too much or a Germany that does too little and gets conquered by an aggressive Russia. And what does that mean for Poland and the Baltic states and Germany, who we actually like? So it, it's difficult to say what direction the bad choices would go, but there are a lot of worse outcomes than the outcomes that we have. And I fear that the people who would destroy the liberal international order, or at least allow it to atrophy, 
underestimate the number of bad outcomes that are available to us and may well be chosen by the allies who are currently very receptive to what we want them to do. I do think the Trump administration has badly damaged American credibility. Um, but this isn't the first time American credibility has been damaged. The honest to God truth is the United States isn't a very good ally. I mean, ask France, our first ally uh, in the 1780s, how reliable we were when they made our independence possible. So um, it's not a new thing. The, the fundamental constraint on America's commitments is the willingness of the American people to honor them at any given moment in time. And even America's closest friends, Germany, Great Britain, France, are always worried about that fact. They're either worried we will do too little or they're worried we will do too much. There's a, there's a great example from the 1958 Berlin crisis when uh, President Eisenhower sent John Foster Dulles to see the German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, to assure him that the United States would cross the nuclear threshold and fight a nuclear war with the Soviet Union in order to preserve the independence of West Berlin. And the German Chancellor's answer was, good God, no, not for Berlin. Um, so, you know, America's allies are always worried about our reaction and their worry is both justifiable and a structural element of their dependence on us. Uh, so uh, again, one of the values of the alliance relationships that we have is that we're always talking about these things because we can't have a strategy that is something Germany wouldn't be able to willing to execute or require of them prices they are, aren't willing to pay. If Germany's willing to cede West Berlin, we will have to cede West Berlin. If South Korea isn't willing to fight a war, um, then we can't fight a war they're not gonna be a partner in. So our alliances give us constant real-time feedback about what is and isn't possible as we go forward together with countries on whose territory we will be fighting to protect and advance our interests. So the book I thought I was writing when I set out to explore the Anglo-American hegemonic transition was a book about several peaceful hegemonic transitions. And I was gonna write political science. What's the same and what's different about these? And I realized there's actually only one peaceful hegemonic transition. And you can't write political science if N equals one. So I wrote a history of the only peaceful transition between a rising challenger and a dominant rule giving and enforcing power in the international order. And that's between Britain and the United States. I start in 1823, because that, the Monroe Doctrine, was the first example of the US trying to stipulate a different kind of international order. And I look at, I don't know, eight or nine different inflection points where the US tries to change the rules and Britain has to make de policy decisions about how to respond. In my judgment, the fundamental reason that the transition between British dominance and American hegemony, uh, the reason that it is peaceful is because by the 1870s, the US, because of westward expansion, had become an imperial power. And Britain, because of its intensive um, electoral uh, changes to their electoral law, Britain by the 1870s had become a democracy. And because of those two elements, the, Britain and the United States looked similar to each other and different from every other state in the international order. So 
the, the relative power between them mattered less than their cumulative power with re respect to every other country in the international order. So it made it, it created the space for policy compromise between them in a way that didn't exist for other hegemonic powers. And the, them both being democratic powers is essential because you had the buffering that civil society gives in democratic states. And that both created space for compromise and restrained the more militaristic policy choices, especially of a rising United States. My favorite example of it is uh, the moment that I think that the transition actually occurs is in an obscure, um, uh, you know, third world country, Venezuela, in 1895, where um, the United States was behaving extraordinarily recklessly. And the civil society of both the United States and the United Kingdom reached across to remind both governments that neither society actually wanted war over Venezuela. And it created the dynamic by which both governments made more reasonable choices. So if you think about a rising China and what it will mean for the United States, unless a China as it grows more prosperous grows more demanding political consumers and they have the ability to control the Chinese government, you shouldn't expect that transition, if it should occur, to be peaceful. But I'm reasonably confident that Hegel was right. And as countries grow more prosperous, their people become more demanding political consumers. And so a more prosperous, powerful China will actually become a more liberal China. What is for me so interesting about the British and American hegemonic transition is how much this notion of Anglo-American commonality, the natural fraternity of the two countries, that is a consequence of the strategic decisions. It's not a driver of the strategic decisions. Uh, you know, folks should remember that the country we had fought wars against was actually Britain. Bismarck was astonished to see the growth of Anglo-American solidarity because 20% of Americans spoke German in the home. Britain was the only country we'd actually fought. Um, and yet you have, because of the common democratic nature of the two societies, you have a notion of growing similarity and that creates a religious revivalism that is viewed in similar terms in both countries. Transatlantic marriages where American women bring their fortunes to British aristocrats. You have the investment of British capital in the American railroads. Uh, so the British getting rich again off of opportunities they see in westward expansion in the United States. All that craziness, but at the start of the hegemonic transition, you don't have that sense of similarity. And in particular, you don't have it before the American Civil War. You know, Charles Dickens on a lecture tour in the United States says that American society is more barbaric than the Indian nations it conquered. British are shocked at the extent to which the United States claims to be, you know, the great defender of human dignity while also having slavery in the majority of the territory. And even after the American Civil War, the racism prevalent in American society, whether it was um, the suppression of rights of Black Americans or the ease with which the United States took rights, territory, and even children from Native American societies was horrifying to the British. And 
our morality had to catch up with our ideology. For the almost the entirety of the 19th century, it's important to remember that the United States was an illiberal democracy. The beauty of American hegemony is that as we grew more powerful, we also grew more liberal, both domestically and in our behavior internationally. Uh, if you're not talking to Hal Brands, he has an interesting Bloomberg column from a few weeks ago about the way that the Cold War required the United States to actually be truer to its ideology and make advances on civil rights at home. And I think that's true. And you also see it if you look at, for example, American policy towards Cuba in 1898, right? Uh, the, most people think about the Spanish-American War as the kind of debutante ball of the United States as a great power. And at the start of, of the Spanish-American War, you know, the Congress actually required that the United States not take on imperial obligations. And it is sad but true that as we started being successful, the American public and the American Congress um, disgracefully got a lot more comfortable with the United States as a traditional and imperial great power. But that actually doesn't last very long. If you look at um, uh, the, by 1918, the United States is advocating self-determination uh, for uh, not just countries of Europe, but, but for the United States territories as well. And we don't make good on it until 1945, but you see a lot of progress. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for example, declaring the good neighbor policy in Latin America. Not only was, uh, was more virtuous than our behavior in Latin America prior to that time, but it also made possible the Rio Pact which kept countries of Latin America out of Germany's grasp during World War II. So good alliance relations and a foreign policy that, that projects our domestic values internationally is actually really smart cost-effective policy because it makes it easier for other countries to help us. What I notice as a historian of the 19th century is that the major constraint on American activism and American commitments and American behavior internationally has always been the willingness of the American public to, and the, the main way the United States government persuades the American public to care about the rest of the world is by talking about our values, you know, People who think that the Spanish-American War was American imperialism on the move need to come to terms with the fact that the major public impetus actually came from religious communities in the United States who watched the depredations that Spain was imposing on Cuba and cried out for the United States to use its power to protect and advance our values. You know, we get the term concentration camp from the reconcentrados that Spain forced on Cuba, pulling people off of their farms and ranches and putting them in concentration camps to control them, to control their desire for greater individual liberty than Spain was willing to give them. That's how we get dragged into the Spanish-American War. And I'm not defending the choices that we then make, the very imperialistic choices that we make. But the only thing I will say in American defense is we corrected our mistakes faster than other dominant powers corrected their mistakes. So I would say a couple of things about my own career. The first is it always astonishes me when it looks to other people like I made a shrewd set of strategic choices that propelled me to success. 
because mostly what my own professional life looks like is a series of shipwrecks where I then try to hail passing liners uh, to get myself out of the shockingly cold and dangerous seawater. The advice I would give to people starting out in their career, whether they want to be somebody, especially if they want to be somebody who applies what they know about the world in a policy context, is don't make safe choices. Um, it is much better not to do the conventional thing, but instead to do what you're interested in, to study what you're interested in, join the Marine Corps, create an NGO in Sub-Saharan Africa, go be a Peace Corps volunteer. You will think about the world differently from having more experience of it than you can get by taking a safe and credentialing path. Um, and it will give you more opportunities in your 30s if you do interesting things, even if you fail at them as I failed at them in your 20s, you will understand the world more and you will be a more interesting, more uh, opportunistic hire in your 30s and 40s. So I was the only civilian in the joint staff of 1500 people when I worked there in 1990. And I think it's possible I was even the only woman in the staff. And yet my experience was an extraordinarily positive one because the American military in its top echelons, it really is a meritocracy. Moreover, they can't succeed unless they can make everyone around them successful. And I was the weak link in everybody's chain because I didn't have the kind of experience that trained their judgment. So, so I had extraordinarily good and generous teachers early on, but I also had bosses who wanted it to be a good experience for me. And when they saw me having difficulties, taught me how to assert myself. And I had the institutional backing of bosses who wanted my experience as a woman in a predominantly male, predominantly military staff to be a positive one. So the first thing is just to validate the advice that Colin Powell gave me when I was 26, which is choose your jobs by choosing your bosses. Because even a bad job with a good boss, you'll get lots of opportunities and you'll learn a ton. But um, a bad boss won't protect you when things go awry, and things always go awry. The second thing I would say is um, that what the joint staff taught me was to demand to be treated as a professional in my workplace. And that for me is how I have handled many of the challenges of being a woman in foreign and defense policy, by just demanding to be treated as a professional in my workplace and treating everybody else as professionals in my workplace. I always a little bit worry that when women, women come to dominate the foreign and defense field, we may behave as badly as men behave and that it's a function of having power and authority, not a function of gender. Um, so I would love to be wrong about that. So those of you in the sisterhood behave the way you want everybody else to behave as you become the dominant force in the field.